Now, um, bearing in mind you could probably make a good living out of cash games just mm. in this kind of arena, what motivates you to play in these tournaments? Um, well, actually, the cash games have been a bit dead in London recently. Um, uh, although I think, uh, generally speaking, if I could play uh, a 1025 game, for example, uh, every day, uh, and I could know that I could get a decent game every day, I I'd make way more money than I make in tournaments, even though I've had a really good couple of years in tournaments. Um, I think, generally speaking, tournaments are slightly more fun. Uh, I know that's a bit terrible of me to admit that I'm playing for fun when really it's supposed to be about money and ripping the other people's eyes out and everything and making as much as you can out of the time. Uh, but it is fun when you go deep in a tournament and I mean you can really, uh, you can't really beat that feeling of winning a big field tournament. Uh, if I win a big pot in a cash game I, I don't get as excited as I get about running deep in a tournament. I think you get emotional attachment in a tournament. Like that's one of the reasons why in the live game, uh, people are, you know, they have a sort of Phil Helmuth thing of tournament life. They're, they're scared to get knocked out, so they make suboptimal plays. And it's because they have an emotional attachment to the tournament. They've invested time in it. Maybe they've had to beg the missus to give them the night out and they're allowed out once a week. Uh, maybe they had to travel a long way to get to the tournament. Um, maybe it's an expensive buy-in for them. Uh, so people get emotionally attached to the tournament and that makes them play badly. Uh, but I get emotionally attached to the tournament in the same way. Uh, hopefully it doesn't make me play badly and hopefully I'm prepared to you know, put all my money in in a good situation, whether it's the first hand and I've flown 6,000 miles to get there. But uh, I definitely think you know, I, I kind of get more of a high out of playing a tournament than I do in a cash game. Um, and also, like in terms of the cash games, um, even if I play smaller, which uh, you know I probably have to play a bit smaller these days in London just because of the recession and the number of players around, that there aren't so many interesting big games. Um, so I'm forced to play a bit smaller if I want to play regularly. Uh, I kind of find I have a bit of trouble with that. I, I don't always respect the game as much as I ought to. And that's an area I probably... That's not very good, really. I should probably think about that a bit more you know I sometimes find it harder to concentrate or or to play my best when I'm playing in a smaller game so you know like the, the tournaments it's always big and and just recently with all these young kids doing well in the tournaments like uh, uh, Jake Cody and Matt Perrins and John Eames and Toby uh, Lewis and James Mitchell and various other people um, I can get bets on now on all the tournaments so whenever I if, even if say we're playing a 500 tournament in the Vic which I, I wouldn't necessarily have played two years ago because just missing eight hours of the cash game or something to get knocked out, you know, 20 places off the money would be too much of a waste of time. Uh, I can now get a side bet with like six different people where if I win the tournament, maybe I get an extra 10 grand or 20 grand or something. So suddenly I'm playing a 500 pound tournament where it could be worth 100 grand to me if I win it or 150 or something. Well, now it's now it's a lot more interesting. Now I want to spend my time playing the tournament. Even at, like, I've played a couple here recently where it was just a 500 buy-in or a 300 buy-in, uh, where I can win triple the first prize if I win it. And uh, yeah, that's that's exciting and it's fun as well because now I'm like you know I'm sticking the knife into the boys as well. So we get there's a lot of banter going on. We've been doing a lot of that all through the EPT tournaments. We were doing all sorts of side bets and stuff. And I played. I played all the 1,000 events and the 1,500 events, which last year I, I didn't play any. I think I played one of them the whole time. So. Still, I like the tournaments anyway, they're fun. Uh, speaking of fun, you played the um, Party Poker Big Game. Mm. I believe you played 48 hours constantly. Was that fun? Ah, the Party Poker Big Game is always fun. Yeah, that's the third year uh, that they've done it. Actually, the fourth year they've done it was the third year they asked me to play. Uh, and uh, last year I... Uh, I actually had a meeting with somebody which was kind of important to the whole setting up of Black Belt and the guy had flown into the country and he was only going to be here for one day. Uh, so I had to leave two hours before the end having played, I think it was a 36 hour game last year and I played for 34 and I was gutted that I didn't do the whole time. Uh, so this year it was a 72 hour game and I said yeah I'm going to play the whole time. But they introduced this system where you could vote, at the, you know the players voted out a player. Uh, which I personally hated, uh, and um, it was pretty annoying because there was a time where we're playing eight players, 
uh, and you're exempt from being voted out if you uh, if you'd only been there less than six hours. So there were uh, four people on the table who were exempt from being voted out uh, because they'd only been there less than six hours. Uh, and Viffa was on the table and he was the most aggressive, so he couldn't be voted out. So there's three people left that could be voted out, one of whom is uh, a complete idiot. Uh, so basically it was between me and Phil Lark as to who could still be voted out. And uh, I got voted out. I was scutted. I, I had to leave the game for... Well, I literally, I did an interview. They said, how do you feel about being voted out? I said, pissed off. Uh, and I told them why. And, uh, and then Tony G, who had already told me before the vote that he was leaving in 10 minutes anyway, left. And they said, oh, there's a seat now, you can go back on again. So it was pretty annoying because now, uh, at the end, Viffa was able to say he was the only person who played 72 hours because I played 71 and a half. But uh, he was pretty done in at the end. And uh, I don't know, I went out to dinner with Phil Lark afterwards and then we rung the Vic and asked him if there was a cash game we could get into. Uh, but they didn't have a game, so uh, I did go to sleep. But, no, I would play that game like if I could. If they had that game like every month or something, I would just literally I would be in it every single time. I, I didn't. I wasn't a hundred percent happy with my performance in it. Uh, it was a kind of a weird game. I mean, obviously Viffa was an interesting dynamic. He raising every hand. I'm, I've got immediate position on him, but then the rest of the table, I, you know, get a lot of information when Viffa raises and I act. If I, you know, if. Some people on the internet were saying, oh, you know, he's very passive, Channing. Why doesn't he have a three-bet Viffa? Well, I think that's a very bad tactic because he's raising every pot. If I three-bet, I have four people behind me who are all good players, you know, people like Phil Lark and Sam Trickett sitting behind me. If they get to see that, it's pretty easy for them to adapt to that. So I felt like continually flat-calling his raises was, was a much better thing to do because it kept the pot small and people didn't really know what... You know, I didn't give much away about my hand strength because I did it with really good hands and really bad hands. So uh, I was pretty happy with that. But yeah, it didn't quite work out. I mean, I had uh, I had one really good beat where I flopped set under set and uh, made quads for 75 grand pot. Uh, and everybody remembered that one. In fact, probably never four days goes by without somebody mentioning it to me now. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had quite a few bad beats. No one's mentioned those ones, but everyone's been telling me how lucky I was in that game. I, I, all I remember is I was winning about 50 and ended up losing 25. So, yeah, I've had better days, but it was uh, it was still fun. Uh, now, it's been a great year for British players. We've seen EPT wins, WPT wins, um, yeah. bracelets here, there and everything. Um, is there a particular reason or a particular set of reasons why we've been doing so well this year, do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a few reasons, actually. I think uh, uh, numbers. It's a numbers game. I mean, you know, the World Series five years ago. Uh, I remember I did an interview uh, five years ago at the World Series. They said to me, how many events are you playing? And I said, uh, four. And they said, do you think you're going to win a bracelet? And I said, no. Uh, and they said, what do you mean, no? Well, it's not very good, is it? You know, you would be a bit more optimistic than that. I said, I'm playing four events. There's like a thousand people. In those days, there was a thousand people in each event. I said, Probably, I'm not going to win a bracelet. If you ask me what the odds are on me winning a bracelet, it's about 40 to 1. Uh, if you ask me the odds on me making a final table, it's about 6 to 1. The next year I played 12, they did the same interview. I told them I was about, I don't know, whatever, I can't remember. But, you know, obviously, the more events you play, the more chance you've got. In, in, in that time, four years ago, it was me, Serena, a couple of the Hendon mob, uh, probably all the Hendon mob actually, uh, Dev Devilfish, that was pretty much it for the Brits. A few people would come over and play a couple of events near the end, maybe play the main event, one other event. There wasn't many people playing out of the 55 events, a whole bunch of them. I think partly because of James Aiken had made in the final the year before, and partly just because of a sort of uh, something that's built up over three years or so. Um, people are now starting to play, you know, I, I'd speak to people like, you know, John Eames, who's not a household name in poker, but I think he's a really good young player. He tells me he's playing like 15, 20 grand's worth of events. I used to play like four grand's worth of events or six grand's worth of events when I was his age. I sound like an old fogey, but you know, like five years ago or whatever, which was just, I was considerably older than him, but whatever. Um, there's probably 60 people now from the UK that are playing 20 grand's worth of World Series events. 
I, I think also they are very good. You know, we do have a good generation. I think Toby Lewis, John Eames, Jake Cody, uh, James Mitchell, uh, all of these, uh, Tom McDonald, Stuart Rutter. I, I could name you a hundred, and I think they are excellent. I mean, you know, and I'm saying the young guys as if the hit squad are really old. I mean, James Aiken had Praz Bands. Yeah, they've been around a few years, but these are still young guys that are doing fantastic. Um, I think um, we've got a really good team. Uh, and I think that the, the thing that they've done, which they all do, I mean, the hit squad is one little little group. The Hendon Mob was the original group like that. Uh, this little mob I, I've talked about a few times of Jake and Toby and uh, John and, and James and various others. Uh, they all travel around together, they talk about poker, they hang out together, they stay in the same hotel. Uh, they're all on MSN together, they're, all, they're, they're into it and they talk about it and they form communities. And I think that's what the Scandies were doing five years ago. I think that's what the Americans have done with 2 plus 2 uh, and various other little pocket fives and other communities like that. And I don't think we've been very good at doing that in the UK. I think if you look at some of the websites in the UK, they're, you know, if anyone tries to discuss strategy, people are quite cynical and they get slapped down quite quickly and people are not allowed to develop ideas and, and be made to look foolish. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the, I don't want to keep harping on about Blackboard, but I think it's one of the things that we've tried to do is to be a platform for people. And I'm not saying that these kids have done it because, you know, Jake and, and, uh, and, and Toby are, are excellent, excellent players and I'm not claiming any responsibility for them suddenly winning. But I think a bunch of players getting together and forming communities and talking about poker and exchanging ideas has got to be good for the game. And, uh, uh, you know, those kids that when we did our first grading at Black Belt and we put 50 people through a trial of playing online poker for a month and coming to workshop days, um, Toby Lewis was one of them, James Mitchell was another, people like J James Keyes and Ben Vinson uh, were involved in that process. And I think getting those kind of people to all get together in a room and talk about poker, it's got to be a good thing. And, I, 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 you know, we probably have a 1% part in it at Black Belt, but I'm proud of the part we've, we've played, and I hope we can do more of that in the future.